All right, so Google being Google just decided to throw compute power at the problem. Um, they use automatic search techniques, um, which I assume means something like, you know, swarm intelligence type something to discover new activation functions. So they basically just automatically generated random activation functions out of a very wide family of functions. I think it was like any polynomial of trig functions. It was very generous. And they discovered a handful that, again, to quote, tend to work better than ReLU on deep models across a number of challenging data sets. So um, if I sound a little foggy on this, it's because I have not found it incredibly important to read this paper because, again, it's not amazingly subtle. It's Basically, we are Google, we threw compute power at it, here's the new activation function we found. So they found an activation function that worked better than any known derivative of ReLU, and they named it Swish, tragically. The Swish function is this. The derivative is this. Be real thankful you don't have to derive that, one, and you don't have to type it, two, right? Thank God TensorFlow already knows the derivative, derivative of Swish and we don't have to care. All right. That sigma is the logistic sigmoid. It is also an S-shaped function. Oops. Although it runs from zero to one and it's um, wider is the short, is the simplest way to say it. This slope is lower and this region is wider than tan age. So if you look at the derivative, it's, so a graph of the derivative is very similar, but it's lower and wider. You don't really need to know that, right? It's x times sigmoid of x. It has this controlling parameter beta, which I believe we'll talk about in a minute. And it has this crazy derivative that be happy you don't have to know or understand or ever type yourself. So here are a couple of different graphs of Swish for different beta. We notice the behavior of Swish depends on the value of beta. So if it is 0.1, it is this very shallow, so I say shallow meaning very low slope thing that doesn't change very rapidly, right? And it seems to behave very kind of linearly. It looks almost like a straight line, right? I think it very slightly curves, especially in the negative half, but it's not much, right? It looks very similar to a straight line. And for beta equals one, we see, and we maybe can't get a very good look at it, but we see that it kind of dippy down dips right there, and then it goes up. And then for values, or for the value of 10, it behaves very near ReLU, right? It looks a lot like it's zero, like it's zero and then it's maybe a straight line, right? So it's sort of kind of tunable with beta. You can drive it from very near ReLU to very near straight line with a kind of, you know, flourishy thing in the middle. If we look at the derivative, we see that the derivative of low beta is, right, this very smooth, so that, the derivative looks like it is a straight line. It looks very smooth, right? Which again, kind of makes sense. So, hmm. Yeah, hadn't thought about what I was gonna say there. Need to think carefully, right? Kind of makes sense, right? If this is a sort of very gentle function that is very slowly changing its behavior, right? Very rapid changes in behavior mean high derivative. Very slow changes in behavior mean low smooth derivative. And that's what we're seeing here, right? Derivative is not really very large anywhere. It doesn't change sharply. So it kind of corresponds rationally to that. Gentle, slightly increasing slope. So for very, um, very large beta, beta equals one, and that's the one that looks kind of like a ReLU, we see that the derivative is very, very, very low, and then it changes very rapidly, and then it's one, right? It's very close to zero, it boodly boops for a bit, and then it's very close to one. And again, that's kind of like the derivative of, Rel of ReLU, right? So remember that ReLU's derivative is zero, one, right? So it's got a very ReLU-like behavior. And then again, in the middle, we see this very smooth, 
dare I say, graceful kind of behavior, where the derivative is low, it's slightly less than zero, then it scales, its derivative is near, okay, yeah, so the derivative is near zero for a while, oh, wait, no, backing up, I'm wrong. No, no, I'm not, okay, yeah, sorry. So yeah, the derivative is close to zero for a while, and then it begins to increase around zero, and then it stabilizes around one, but it has these kind of graceful, continuous, smooth, uh, I want to call that a dip and a bump, right? So yeah, note that it depends strongly on beta. So there's a look at, so there's a look at just, the, at just squish for the beta equals one value, right? Notice that it is actually less than zero here. So here's zero, I cannot draw. And notice that it's actually going down, then it goes up, right? And that it is, it is bounded, I believe, to zero, but it is not bounded to the right, right? It approaches positive infinity at, oh my gosh. Right, it goes to positive infinity at an input of positive infinity, right? So swish is not bounded, right? In the same way that ReLU wasn't bounded. Swish is not even monotonic. So again, if math was a long time ago, a function is monotonic if it is only increasing or only decreasing. All of the functions we've looked at have been monotonic, right? Tan h, oh my gosh. One day I'll be able to draw an s. Tan h is only increasing, right? ReLU is either constant or increasing. It's constant over here and then increasing over here. Right? Um, even the ELU, right? The exponential linear unit is negative one, right? So it's pretty close to constant. And then it's increasing. All of these things are only increasing. Swish is not monotonic, right? It is decreasing for a little bit and then it increases. Why does that matter? Because the derivative is narrow, or narrow, negative. There's this little bitty region, maybe not so little, because it might still be negative there, right? Where the derivative is negative, right? And again, if you think back to calculus, negative derivative means decreasing, okay? So if you're a monotonic function, a monotonically increasing function, like tan h, if your desired behavior is 0 0.9, well, let's not even worry about that. If your error is negative, so your output was low, right? If your error is negative, is less than 0, then you know at any point in this range that you have to increase your output, right? So if your error was negative, you know your output was low and you have to increase it, which means you have to increase your weights, right? You have to go to the right. Everywhere in the range of tan h, that is true. And conversely, obviously, if your error is greater than zero, everywhere in the range of tan h, that means you have to decrease your weights and move your output to the left, right? Because it's monotonic, because it's always increasing, that means that everywhere, decreasing your input decreases your output, and increasing your input increases your output. Swish is not like that. If you are right here, and your error is negative, right, your output was too high, you will go this way, right? So you kind of got to squint very closely here, but I'm assuming about right there is the global minima of swish. If you're over here to the left of the global minima and your output is negative, then you will go right. If you're over here and your error is negative, 
you will go to the left, right? Wow, that's a bad choice. You will go to the left, see? So for swish, it has this weird change in behavior where a negative error means different things in different halves of the domain of the thing, right? A negative error will pull you right or left based on which side of the global minima you're on because it's not monotonic. It's not always increasing, right? And that's kind of a problem, right? In some sense, there seems to be an ambiguity, we would think intuitively, if our error signal tells us to go in different directions in different halves of the domain, right? That would seem to be weird if you think about it. But in practice, it ends up working, right? So for a long time, people not unreasonably assumed that error functions had to be bounded and monotonic, and swish is an example of a function that in Google's experimenting definitely works, and in fact performs slightly better than the best known output, right? The best known activation function, despite being neither monotonic nor bounded, right? So swish is odd. Here's the error signal for swish. Here I used, again, a beta of one. Since it saturates, right? So again, it saturates negative. So after it starts saturating, the error signal goes to zero. But we do have this little, little bitty dip in the area around zero where we are getting some error backflow. We notice also that it bends slightly. Right? So whereas ReLU was just, or I'm sorry, yeah, whereas Re, the error signal for ReLU was a mathematically straight line, the error signal for Swish is not. I would have to go back to the derivative of it to figure out why it isn't. I'm too lazy to do that. It doesn't really matter. But we do know that just like all, we do notice that just like all the other variants of ReLU, right, Swish has positive error backflow for all of the positive range, right? Zero to infinity, we get a nice strong error signal. So the takeaways of all of this, ReLUs allow us to train much deeper networks because it doesn't squash the error, right? But some of them die. Leaky ReLU or LReLU solves the dying ReLU problem. After that, people discovered the exponential linear unit, ELU and Swish. Um, so what, what, yeah, reasonable things that we can do, we can start with leaky ReLU and then see how ELU and Swish perform if we want. You could also just cut to the chase, oops, wrong button, could also just cut to the chase and start with Swish, right, since at least Google claims that it outperforms all of the variants of ReLU. If you want to do ReLU, 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 are usually good values for the leak factor alpha. Um, it probably is worth noting at this point that the computational cost of ReLU, of LReLU, is significantly lower than Swish, right? Because LReLU is basically an if and maybe a multiplication, and then Swish is all of that. But it doesn't really matter that much because the computation of all of this is not super expensive compared to the forward pass of your network, right? So wanting to avoid all of that computation is probably not a huge factor in picking, picking an activation function. Okay, so now is the part where we're gonna go to a TensorFlow example.